Are we live? Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. We've, we're having some technical problems this morning, but I hope everyone can hear me now. Right. Welcome to the uh, webinar that we have, we have arranged for to introduce our course, The Carriage of Goods by Sea, an international trade co-organized by the Singapore Maritime Foundation and the SMU. First of all, if I may introduce the instructors. With me would be Mr. Bernard Yee. Mr. Yi is the Managing Director of Resource Law LLC and has been a maritime lawyer for more than 20 years. Ms. Ko Si Bin, who is a Deputy Director of the FDND Department of the North PNI Association Limited, which is a PNI club. Ms. Ko was previously in uh, practice in Rajantan as a partner and has, is now a deputy director, as I said, of, of the North. And then there's, there, there's me. I, I have uh, been in uh, continuous legal practice for 43 years. Yes, uh, that, that sounds like a long time, but yes, 43 years. And until recently, I ran my own law firm and um, now I am principally an arbitrator, mediator, and counsel in Maxwell Chambers, Singapore. Now, just a few uh, housekeeping rules. What we intend to do is to keep this, this uh, webinar sweet and simple and give you a lot of opportunities to ask questions that may be in your mind when, when you saw the course outline and uh, in order that uh, we may convince you that this course is well worth your time. Today's session is scheduled for, to last for one hour. It will be recorded so that if you do feel that you have missed something, uh, you can always access the, the webinar on YouTube, on SMF's YouTube channel. Uh, if you wish to submit questions, please do so using the Q&A button. Uh, we will answer your questions to the best of our ability. And if we need to come back to you, we will do so. If we can't answer all the questions live or in writing, uh, we will do so at some point of time. All you need to do is to look at the screen. You see the, the, uh, the email address there, OPS and SGMF dot com.sg send your question in and that question will be answered right as for the uh, format of the half hour that we are going to take before we hand over for uh, to the questions i'm going to give a short introduction to the course and other relevant information that you may want to uh, get hold of before you consider the course this will be followed by Bernard Yi, who will be your principal instructor as far as the bills of leading component is concerned. And then following Mr. Yi, Ms. Ko will say a few words about charter parties. I'd like to start with something that I thought uh, I should read to you. Um, and I quote, I believe many of us here today have in the course of our careers been involved in one form or another in the maritime industry. I think we can all agree that it is an enormously exciting and dynamic industry with many storms and tsunamis to tackle and overcome in the physical, legal and financial sense. Nonetheless, it continues to maintain its appeal because the industry offers many opportunities in Singapore and beyond 
to those who have the aptitude, passion, and energy to pursue their interest in this field. For myself, I spent some of the best years of my professional career in the practice of maritime law. Apart from the role it has played in my personal development as a lawyer through my practice, I have made many lifelong, lifelong friends in all corners of the globe, visited ports and countries which I otherwise would never have contemplated. Now, I should tell you that is a quote from a speech given by Justice Stephen Chong or Justice of Appeal Stephen Chong on the opening of the Center of Maritime Law in Singapore. And I hope that speech inspires you to take up this particular course. Now, just a brief introduction to the course. You would have seen the course outline. And you, have, you would have seen that we have broken up the course into three different, say, let's say, components. The last component is international trade. The first component is bills of lading. And in, in the middle, we have charter parties. It's really not possible to do international trade without an understanding firstly of bills of lading and then of charter parties. Because a proper understanding of international trade will involve how you deal with bills of lading, how they are negotiated, what charter party obligations um, the, the, the cargo owners, the buyer or the seller may have undertaken. Without that sort of knowledge, it's impossible to deal with international trade. And as you know, international trade constitutes, international trade meaning carriage of goods by sea, constitutes about 70% of how goods are transported throughout the world. So I would venture to say that when you are going to go into practice, unless you are going to be practicing as a criminal lawyer or in some distinct field like international intellectual property, if you are going to be a commercial lawyer, and most of us will buy to be commercial lawyers, it will be practically impossible for you to avoid in a knowledge of international trade or a dispute involving international trade. It is, as, it is as important as that. Whether you are practicing, whether you are in-house counsel, you will be expected to have some knowledge of international trade. And in order to gain that knowledge of international trade, you need also to understand bills of lading and charter parties. There's other information that may be, that may be relevant uh, to you as far as this course is concerned. Let me tell you that the SMF, which is supporting this course, has got a register of training, training contracts. What we intend to do is to support everyone who is in this course to try and secure a training contract to match anyone who's interested in a training contract in a shipping firm to a job. We will also try and arrange internships. There will be, there will be um, tours to the port facilities in order that you understand how a port works. For my part, I intend to seek out the students who are interested in, in maritime arbitration and in commodities arbitrations to sit in an arbitration as it is ongoing, of course, with the permission of the parties, because those proceedings are confidential. To sit in the arbitrations, watch the arbitrations, to gain a proper understanding of how, what it is to be a maritime practitioner there will also be opportunities for you to join the various associations that are in the maritime ecosystem. There's the Maritime Law Association of Singapore, which Mr. Yi is part of. 
we will, they will invite everyone in this course to become a student member of the Maritime Law Association so that you can join all the seminars for free. We will also introduce you to the SEMA, the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration, so that you can participate in their seminars as well. There are very few areas of the law where lawyers operate as a sort of community. And maritime law is one of those areas. We all know each other. We all behave as a community. And this is what we want right from the beginning, not just when you graduate and then you, 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 you get a training contract in a law firm and you, and you wander into maritime law. But from the time that you actually start your carriage of goods by sea course, so that you become part of our group, become part of our community, and have that sense of belonging in the community. And that is what the course will try and do for you. That is what the SMF is also wants to do for you, so that you become a valuable part of the maritime Singapore community. The career opportunities for you, as far as carriage and international trade are concerned, are not only with with uh, locally based firms. International law firms seek out our students, be they from NUS or SNU, who have knowledge of maritime law and who have knowledge of international trade, because so many of the disputes that are taking place in Singapore, especially in the arbitration area, involve these two areas. The career opportunities are not limited to Singapore either. Because you are not, this is not, in a sense, a consumer law subject. So your career opportunities go beyond Singapore. There are many maritime lawyers who are trained in Singapore, but now work in other jurisdictions. They work in Hong Kong, they work in London, they work in many other places. The next thing perhaps you would want to know is in Singapore, when you are a lawyer, when you have gained some experience, if you want to become accredited by the Singapore Academy of Law as a specialist, there are only two areas of law where the Singapore Academy of Law recognizes specialists. There will be others, I'm sure, in the future, but at the moment, those two areas are construction law and maritime law. So that you have the opportunity after five years of practice in shipping to then apply to become a junior accredited shipping specialist. And after 10 years to apply to become a senior accredited shipping specialist. Now, I will say more about the methodology that we are going to try and use uh, in this course after you have heard from uh, Ms. Yi and Ms. Ko. Um, so perhaps at this time, I should hand over to, to Bernard. Bernard, please. Morning, everyone. Uh... Um, I'm Bernard Yee, uh, Managing Director of uh, Resource Law. As what uh, Ms. Kubani had said, um, I've been in practice for uh, 21 years. And uh, as, a, as evidence of um, how tight-knit or how small this shipping community that he mentioned uh, is, um, I used to work for him uh, for close to 10 years. Right? And Sibin, uh, Ms. Ko Sibin, uh, we were on the same site for a case uh, about 10, 10 years ago. So it's true that the community is, is really tight-knit and small, and we do know each other uh, well. And, and one thing that uh, we really do want to see is for many more young lawyers to come and join this community. So that's, that's a, a bit of a, a background uh, about me. Now, I, I'm 
I've been tasked to uh, give instructions on um, bills of lading, right? Uh, this component of the course on bills of lading. Uh, you can see the course outline on screen, but that's quite dry. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So I just want to share some facts and numbers, and I didn't, I didn't uh, do uh, very much research. I didn't have to do very much research. These information, uh, this information is all on the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore's website. So you can see, um, eighty percent of the world's trade is carried by sea. Right? Annually, there are more than hundred thousand ships uh, that call at Singapore. Now. You would have thought that uh, because of the current pandemic, uh, you will see fewer ships calling uh, or you will see less uh, cargo being uh, shipped into or from Singapore. Um, but surprisingly, that's not true. Uh, in, in fact, the number of uh, uh, ships that are, that are calling in Singapore have, hasn't dwindled, right? And if you look at the, the next slide, these, this information uh, just for the month of May this year will show that the, not only has the numbers not dwindled, they have in fact grown year on year. And I was looking at the past uh, uh, 10 years uh, information. Uh, over the last 10 years, the numbers keep growing every year, right? So if you, if you just look at the, the month of uh, May for container throughput, right? 3.2 million containers came through Singapore, right? And if you look at cargo throughput, it's uh, 51 million tons of cargo uh, came through Singapore. Now, what is the relevance of all, all this information to our course? It is very relevant. Uh, next slide, please. Because it can be quite certain that each of these 3.2 million containers or the 51 million tons of cargo that have come through Singapore just in the month of May will be mentioned uh, in a bill of lading. They will have been shipped on a, a vessel. The vessel would have had to give a document known as a bill of lading to whoever has shipped the cargo, right? And they would, um, when they reach Singapore or whatever other destination, somebody will present the bill of lading to collect cargo. So that's that's why um, the bill of lading is uh, so important and that it has been described as uh, one of the pillars of international trade providing the credit necessary for financing of mercantile trade. And it's also been described as the key uh, to the warehouse. Right. In the, in the uh, course of uh, the three seminars that we uh, will be dealing with uh, bills of lading, we will learn about the functions of the bill of, uh, bill of lading. Uh, primarily, there are three functions. It's evidence of the contract of carriage, as a receipt for the goods covered by it and as a document of title. And then also, um, equally importantly, you'll learn about the rights and obligations of the parties uh, under the Bill of Lading. So that um, is the gist of the contents of the course. Um, we will try to make the course as uh, relevant to current circumstances uh, as we can. Okay, I'm going to uh, end off here and then uh, try to answer whatever other questions that we uh, pose later on. Hi, um, my name is Silin and I am going to be covering the area on charter parties. Um, as Mr. Gabani has mentioned, I'm currently working at the North of England p &I Club um, at the fd and department. The full name is a bit of a mouthful. It stands for freight, demarrage and defense. Um, but essentially what we deal with are disputes arising 
from the chartering operation and owning of vessels. And that, of course, is also the reason why I'm touching on the topic of charter parties. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide. Essentially, charter parties are is something that goes hand in hand with the bills of lading. So having put the cargo on board the ship, you then, of course, have to go into an agreement for the use of the ship, which may be chartered, for example, at the end of the chain by the buyer or the seller, depending on the terms of your sale contract. And that is, of course, where the international trade aspect comes in. So charter parties, basically, it deals with rights and obligations of parties um, in relation to the use of the vessel. So for example, say you rent a car, you'll be thinking about, well, do you, what, how do you make payment for the car? Do you have to deliver the car with a full tank of fuel? Or when you re-deliver, what is the obligation in terms of fuel, et cetera? So when it comes to a vessel, you have similar considerations as well. And of course it deals with issues relating to responsibility for the loading, discharge, um, and as usual, time is money. So there's always some kind of a performance warranty kind of issues that we might also see in practice. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have had this experience, but I remember when I was in year one and I did contract law, you will see a lot of cases um, where the facts are very convoluted. It involves a ship and half the time you might have no idea what they are talking about, apart from the proposition of the law that they're supposed to learn. And I think all this, um, when you do shipping, it gives you a much better appreciation of the facts and the issues that arose in those cases. Um, and it's no surprise, of course, that maritime law is really the area where you find a lot of leading authorities on general contract law. Another point which I would point out would be that maritime law is very international in nature. Uh, we deal frequently with cross-border issues. You have an opportunity to work with foreign lawyers in different jurisdictions. So, so for instance, when you get a case, perhaps your client is telling you that my counterparty is going to declare bankrupt. So one thing that maritime lawyers often deal with is trying to seek security for the claim. You look at other jurisdictions to see what are the tools that can be used to assist your client. So another, um, I would say a very useful aspect when you are dealing with maritime disputes, and that's something which will be valuable, whether you end up doing maritime law or general commercial um, areas in practice subsequently. Now, just to give an illustration of how um, this area is quite closely connected with events happening around the world, one. I have a few examples in the next few slides. If you can go to the next slide. Um, this involves attacks in the Strait of Homers in around the middle of 2019. The Strait of Homers is actually one of the world's most important shipping routes. So at that time, there were a lot of tension between the US and Iran, and there were a few vessels that got attacked when transiting the Straits. Now, what then happened in practice when you go to work the next day is um, we ended up having a lot of questions from ship owners who are concerned about the safety of the region. And one issue that everyone wanted to think about is if my contractual counterparty asked me to go to the Middle East, can I refuse to go? So a question relating to your right and obligation under the charter party. Um, another example in the next slide um, is the issue of piracy. You might have read in the papers that um, there's been an increase in pirate attacks, not just in the Singapore Straits, but also particularly in the Gulf of Guinea, West Africa. So what we have seen also is uh, various concerns relating to the safety of the ship proceeding to these trading areas. So of course, your counterparty, if you are the ship owner, your counterparty would be interested in going to West Africa because no you know, when it's more risky, you get greater monetary returns. But as the owner, they will always be concerned about what if I go there and my ship gets hijacked. So again, um, it is a 
not an uncommon issue under charter parties where you do have clauses dealing with piracy risk and how the risk and responsibility is allocated between parties. Um, the usual question we have again would be, well, in what circumstances can I tell my counterparty that I'm entitled to refuse to go to those areas? Um, the next slide, what I have is something closer to home, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, this is very closely linked to charter party disputes, maritime area as well. You may have read about the difficulties of facing seafarers due to travel restrictions. Um, if we zoom in nearer to the kind of disputes that we have seen, at the start of the pandemic, what we have would be queries relating to force merger under a sale contract, or can I argue frustration um, of, the, of the contract because the port has, the country has been locked down, um, the port is closed, and therefore for the next one month, nothing's going to happen. Okay, and as the pandemic progresses, what we have seen then is you have seafarers stuck on board the ship. So it brings into issues under your charter party where an owner is responsible for the crew. You have to deal with crew changes, but what are you going to do when ports are closed, there are restrictions, ultimately driving up your operation costs. So again, a, a potential area for dispute between parties because whenever it comes to more costs, there will be disputes. Um, and the reason why I pulled out this article as an example is because it basically shows that there was a vessel that loaded in India and arrived in Indonesia with many crew members being infected. So you can imagine the delay at the port in discharging the cargo. So you'll be thinking about issues under your bills of lading, potential claims by cargo interest, for example, if there's a delay in delivery, um, your downstream issues under your sale contracts, and of course, under the charter party, who's going, again, who's going to be responsible um, for the delay. As a ship owner, if your ship is stuck there, you can't earn money. Um, and another interesting thing, of course, is the market rate for hiring of a ship has actually gone up by quite a substantial amount. So again, money speaks. You know? So in the last slide, what I have is um, another illustration uh, arising from China's trade war with Australia. So you might see articles saying vessels are waiting outside China to discharge. Um, and again, this also creates issues under your charter party because who is going to bear the liability for the delay and the cost for waiting outside to enter? And again, let's say you chartered the ship for a certain period and the long waiting time will cause you to exceed the maximum period of the charter. So a whole host of issues um, arises for consideration. Um, I think what I've tried to illustrate is basically to show how tightly connected um, the economy and world events are to the area of shipping. Um, I hope that gives a flavor of the kind of issues that potentially could arise for consideration. So it's a very dynamic area where sometimes you don't really know what is the kind of issues you will get when you go to work. Um, that's all I have for my part. Thank you, Sibin. I, I'm glad Sibin uh, brought out this, uh, how, how closely related some of the, the, the um, cases that you have considered uh, in, in, in contract and taught, how closely connected those cases are to the area of international trade and carriage of goods by sea. Um, by now, you would have appreciated that when, when we are talking about um, international trade and carriage of goods by sea, we're not really talking about a core legal construct or anything, because the core legal construct uh, would, would be the, would be the, um, would be contract law, would be taught. And that is why you see, as, as he did mention, that there's so many of these cases that you do in your first year and, and so forth, um, which don't really make much sense to you beyond the proposition that is there, but will make a lot more sense to you now uh, should you do this course, for instance, um, you start with you start in your in your when you do your contract, you start with the concept of implied terms. Um, but the the more cork, which, which I'm sure you remember, right, is actually a carriage case. 
right? Similarly, uh, if you, if you um, look at the Himalaya, uh, it's also a carriage case where a contracting party um, stipulates an exemption, not only for himself, but for, for, for the benefit of third parties. Goes for, that, that's the case for the Hong Kong fur case, which I'm sure you remember as well. The legal principles concerning um, contractual breach and termination. The wagon mound, I'm sure you remember that one, um, where uh, another shipping case, where the issue of foreseeability <clears throat> was considered in tort. So it, it will help you to appreciate, if nothing else, it will help you to appreciate exactly what the problems were in those particular cases and why they were resolved in a particular way. Let me just say a bit about uh, the intended methodology now, uh, before we hand over for questions and uh, <coughs> to the to the uh, participants. As you can see from the course outline, um, participation and group presentation takes up fifty percent. So we we want everyone in this course to participate in what all three practitioners engage in every day, which is problem solving. We want you to be ready to practice. We want you to be ready to go in-house. So we want you to be able to problem solve. We think we will be able to assist you in problem solving. Once you, um, your, your legal principles are sound, we will be able to uh, assist you in problem solving because problem solving is what we do every day. We will bring these problems, of course, without identifying names and, and so forth. We will, can bring these problems to you and engage you in the same exercise that actual lawyers in a firm engage in to solve that particular problem. Sebin sees these problems on a regular basis because that's her job every day. So does Burnham. So do I as an arbitrator and a mediator. So these problems will be brought to you for group presentation, for participation, so that it can we can make these seminars interesting and relevant to what is going on in the world today. I, I hope that gives you a flavor of what this course is about, and I, I hope that you'll be able to join, to join us. Now, um, we're open for questions. The first question I see is, uh, will the course be available in semester two? The current course schedule clashes with a core module, so it's not available to uh, some of us. Well, that has got to be answered by the SMU. Um, at the moment, it's scheduled for sketch for semester one, um, but if it proves popular, we can always ask the uh, SMU. <clears throat> if it proves popular, we can always ask MU, SMU for, for feedback on that particular question. That's as much as I can say, I think, on that, on that question. Please do ask your questions. We're here to help you. Perhaps one of the things, sorry, uh, there's a question here. If I, um, if I do not intend to specialize in maritime law, should I still take this course? I would say yes. Remember what I read to you when we started this, this session? I read to you a quote from Justice Stephen Chong, Justice of Appeal Stephen Chong. He started in maritime law. But of course, he's uh, he's justice of appeal in the in, in, in the <clears throat> in the court of appeal in Singapore, and he does all sorts of cases. 
Now, I may be a bit biased, but I, can, I would say to you that a maritime lawyer can turn his hand to any other form of litigation. But a litigation lawyer who has not done maritime lawyer, maritime law will not be able to turn the other way. I hope that answers your question. In the Court of Appeal, you will find two maritime lawyers, um, Justice of Appeal Stephen Chong. You will also find uh, Justice of Appeal Judith Prakash, who started as a maritime lawyer and then turned to other things. In the appellate division of the High Court, you will find uh, Justice Belinda Ang who was a maritime lawyer. So yes, I would say you should in, you should take this course even if you do not intend to specialize in maritime law. Remember what I said about international sale of goods. You will have some, at some point of time in your career, have to deal with sale of goods. It's just impossible to me if you, if you practice for, for a long time that you will be able to avoid that. Next question. Thank you for the sharing. Could I just ask, will the course also be touching on areas of international arbitration? Since as earlier mentioned, international arb is very pertinent in shipping related matters. Would you recommend also taking another module? I would say that you should take another module. The course will, won't deal with international arbitration because that is quite a course by itself. Uh, I'm not sure that is offered by the SMU, but the, the, it's important that you understand international arbitration. And as I'm an arbitrator, I will, in the course of the instruction, help you along to understand some of the concepts of international arbitration. But it is not the whole purpose of the course. I would say that it is something that you can jump onto when when you have finished this particular course and it, the international arbitration course will make a lot more sense once you have finished this course will we be dealing with some matters or issues in you know, area of admiralty law such as ship arrest i the answer to that is no we wouldn't be dealing with admiralty law in this particular course there's a reason for that if your appetite is whetted as a result of this course. You can always go into Admiralty Law. Admiralty Law, by the way, is available as a subject in Part B, I believe, before you get admitted. So that's an optional. Do please take up Admiralty Law if you're interested in Part B before you get admitted to the bar. But there's so much content in this course that we thought that we would want you to understand how goods are sold and delivered throughout the world. And Admiralty Law would have been just too much to add onto this particular module. Ah, interesting question to Ms. Ko. Ms. Sibin, can you see the question? Sibin? Sibin? Hi, hi, yes, uh, I'm trying to just take a look at the yes. question. Okay, I'll read the question to you. How's life in a PNI club different from that in a law firm? <laughs> Straightforward question. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, well, I spent close to 10 years at Raja and Khan where I started out as a pupil. I would say, of course, the key difference in a club is I no longer um, appear in court. So that is a very key big difference. In a way, it removes the stress of dealing with hearings and preparing uh, for the same. But of course, at the same time, uh, a big part of the excitement um, is, of course, no longer there. But the reason I think um, I went into a club was I thought it was a very close um, experience to, to practice in the sense that I would still be dealing 
largely with maritime law issues. Um, but at the same time, I'm not exactly an in-house counsel where you are basically serving just the interests of one party. So here I, I still get the experience of dealing with um, different clients, so as to speak. Um, so you do see the broad variety of issues. I, I hope that answers the question. Well, you know, just to add on to that, uh, a lot of the people in the PNI clubs in Singapore actually emanated from my firm. You know, I even uh, the director of FDAD in Singapore, I think Sieben's immediate uh, superior, also emanated from my firm. Yeah. So yes, the, yes. the uh, so there are, there are a lot of people out there that started out in practice and go on to clubs. And I think that also shows how close and small the community, the community is, is in, yes, in the shipping yes. bar where we just know um, yes. you know people that we deal with whether as mm. uh, opponents or on the same side um, and I think one reason I went to North of course is because I knew I know Elvin uh, my current boss who was also at Raja and Tan so that explains yes. all these connections right okay and there was, uh, Sorry? I was just going to add something yes. sure, there sure, was an uh, earlier question of uh, whether we should do uh, shipping law if, even if we don't want to specialize right yes as american but you know just thinking about it uh, mm. in my practice now uh, in the last uh, 18 months or so mm. i've had to deal with two cases uh, one dealing with food mm. another dealing with pharmaceuticals and these are all uh, disputes that uh, that i that are in the courts now, now absolutely nothing to do with shipping but mm. The, the training that you know I have uh, I have gained uh, over the years of practicing uh, maritime law, how we ana uh, analyze uh, cases. I mean, no problem. Mm. It's uh, it's it's some. It may not be dealing with ships, may not be dealing with cargo, but still, the uh, doesn't doesn't prevent me from doing uh, these sort of cases, even though I'm a maritime lawyer. Man, and it may interest you to know, uh, Bernard and I have appeared together in a, in a court of appeal on many cases, um, <laughs> which do not involve maritime law, product liability, liability cases of all sorts. Yeah, um, we, we did the, yeah. uh, oh, stealing of the <laughs> uh, misappropriation yeah, we're of done printing machines. Cases, <laughs> machines, but not, you know, so like I said, you train yourself as a maritime lawyer, you can do any sort of litigation, but if you are a general litigator, I think you'll find it very hard to become a maritime litigator. You can't reverse the other thing around. Of course, it's always possible, but it's going to be difficult for you. Right? There's a question on how, uh, whether or not, uh, how in-depth the course work will be. Yes. And uh, the outline appears to be, seems to be, something that's 1.5 uh, course units worth of content. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm quite sure that, uh, that, that this course uh, will be manageable. Well, let me, let me just uh, add to that to say that, yes, we have discussed, of course, with Professor C, um, the course outline and uh, we don't want for the standards to be um, the, for the standards to drop but the standards will have to remain you must have good standards in everything that you do so the core standard will not be um, to put it politely uh, below average right the core standard will be a high standard. We will have to ensure that. But what we want also is that the course will work in such a way that it will prepare you for a problem solving career as a maritime lawyer, whether it's as in house or whether it's. Uh, uh, in the clubs or whether it's in, the, in a law firm, doesn't really matter. I hope that helps. What's the demand for market demand for maritime lawyers? Sounds highly specialized. 
Uh, Bernard, you want to try that? <laughs> yeah. uh, I would say demand is high, uh, especially given that the, over the last decade or so, the, the number of uh, a new young maritime lawyers coming online uh, is uh, small, right? Um, so as long as um, you are capable, right? And hardworking. And hardworking, yeah. right? You, you will, it will not be uh, difficult, I think, to secure a job. Okay, I would add to that. I would add to say, in fact, the demand is very high. Mm. And um, there are more positions available than there are, there, are, there are young graduates willing to, willing to accept these positions. Partly because they have not trained themselves as you have now have the opportunity. That's one thing. And partly because they perceive the, perceive the, the job to be Difficult. It is not difficult. It is just plain interesting and it requires commitment. There is no two, two ways about it. I mean, I've been in this for, as I say, for more than 40 over years, Bernard 20 over years, and even less. But there is never a dull day. <laughs> okay, there is never a dull day. There is never a same situation where you say, what? Okay, you pass on to your paralegal and then he will just do the job while you talk to your client. A lot of, lot of lawyers actually practice that way because they are just businessmen and then who we'll pass on to, to others and then it all becomes very routine. There is no such thing if you want to become a maritime lawyer. You are engaged. You are thinking and you will think all the time. You will know what is going on in the world. You absolutely are connected. And that's what keeps us in keeps this whole thing interesting. This, that's what the lifeblood of maritime law is all about. And can I also add that, um, yes. you know, in other areas like in-house where you have the lights of the oil majors, um, yes. bunkering companies or trading houses and commodity firms, um, that's where I think a maritime lawyer would also be attractive to all these entities as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's certainly if you want to go into commodity firms, there's, there's no question that you, you need to be trained in this. You need to understand your bills of lading, your charter parties, your international trade. Otherwise, it's possible for you to, to be in-house in any commodities firm. For, or for, or for that matter, in, in, uh, uh, in any legal organization, buying and selling is part of the whole process. They are in there to, to make money. So, how, I would say, you know, it's bordering, if, I, if there's ever such a thing, it's bordering on a compulsory subject, if you ask me. If only we had all these opportunities when we were in school, law school, all those years ago. It, for those who carry on uh, in shipping practice, you know, um, and you and uh, you you will get to see uh, interesting places. You get to visit, uh, go on board ships, right? Uh, do crazy things uh, like taking a launch out to the anchorage at midnight or three o'clock in the morning, because you you've, you just have to have to go interview a crew. It, like what Mr. Bani said, never a dull moment. Uh, it's but, just yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but right. just just to understand that is not a compulsory thing, man. No, not, it's a... not to not to scare we go. <laughs> but there the, the, there are opportunities in that area. Uh, the uh, if if you want to do other areas of shipping law, um, such as collisions and and what is generally called wet work, but for for this particular course, uh, which is what we call dry dry shipping, what. Um, dry shipping in the sense that it is connected with um, uh, with contractual disputes and tortious disputes and trade disputes. Um, 
you will be dealing with people from all over the world, but uh, field work, as far as field work is concerned, it's not it's not an essential. It's uh, not an essential. Yes. So, but you you will have opportunities to deal with people from all over the world. I mean, it's it's not just uh, Singapore. So even at my age, I was on the uh, on, on a Zoom call with some uh, with a lawyer yesterday from Benin. Uh, yes, I I know. A lot of you probably will not know where the heck Benin is. <laughs> okay, uh, it's, in, it's in Africa and um, I had some difficulties understanding me. He had some difficulties understanding. Uh, we, we, we couldn't understand each other. In the end, the client um, interpreted uh, because he was, half of what he said was in French, Benin being a fr former French colony. So you get these opportunities all the time. You deal with people from all over the world and uh, it makes life really interesting. Now, there's a question here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yee. Can you elaborate more on the learning journeys of the course? I'm not sure what that is. No, uh, no. But mm. Bernard, yes. I don't really know what learning journeys are. Oh, I see. Mm. Um, we did mention that we will try to secure uh, an opportunity to visit the, the, the ports uh, in Singapore to see how it operates and to really to, to, to um, <laughs> let you appreciate how this whole ecosystem, you know, chartering vessels, uh, putting uh, cargo on vessels, uh, and then how, how the cargoes are discharged, you know, to, to let you see uh, real life how this work. Um, apart from that, there's also um, try to get get you involved um, in arbitrations uh, where possible to observe arbitrations. Um, so that's that's uh, what we intend to have for what we call the field component. Yeah, just to add there, uh, the mm. the. Um... When we, have, we have, when we have students, and you know, it may not always be possible for everyone to go and observe an arbitration, right? Sure. But uh, the, so long as you register your interest in, 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 in such an event, then in the course of your being an SMU, or even after you, you come out, we will involve you. Because we don't intend to let you go. It, it is not a course where uh, we teach you and forget you. We don't want that. That is why we want you to come in to the SCMA. We want you to come into the Maritime Law Association so that we know that you're interested in, in attending an arbitration. Even after we have finished in, in December. Yeah. Some, of course, will have the, may have an opportunity before then. Some may not have the opportunity to observe an arbitration, but we can involve you in an arbitration as they come along. Send you an email. SMF will, will work on your, with you on that. Just register your interest and say, all right, this, this, this particular opportunity is available. Do you, want, do you want to come along? That's how it's going to work. As far as the visit to the ports are concerned, that will be in the course of, 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 the, uh, of the next few months. And that's not a problem. And we will always be available as um, as the three of us for any questions that you may want to ask us. I don't know about CBIT, but uh, when I was doing my carriage course in, in NUS, 83 years ago, 82 years ago, uh, I was also taught by uh, three practitioners, you know, uh, one of whom is my colleague now, uh, one of whom uh, I had appointed as uh, counsel, and one of whom uh, is, is an opponent on a re regular basis. So it just shows, you know, uh, the connection that we have in the community it doesn't stop, you know, after you leave law school or after you finish this course. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, just, just, uh, just to add to that, yeah, I mean, Bernard, of course, um, was with me for 10 years. And Bernard's immediate superior in his in, in the law firm that he is with now, Resource Law, 
uh, was with me for how many years, but 20 years. One. Uh, yeah, I think almost. About 20 years. So now Mohan, Mr. Mohan is now a judicial commissioner in, in the High Court. So the you see, as a judicial commissioner, yes, do everything, but he started off in maritime law. He was a full-time maritime lawyer, but now he has, he, he's able to turn his hand to anything else. So that's in relation to one of the previous questions that, that were asked. So now, uh, unless there are any, we can handle one last question, um, if there are any questions. Otherwise, we hope that um, you've had some insight you, uh, into the course that we are intending and uh, that you will join us in, um, in our mission to try and improve the supply of maritime law lawyers in Singapore. Now you will find a webinar satisfaction survey for the for the SMF. Uh, please do take some time to try and fill it up to help us know. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, Thank you. let me just check with the, whether there's anything else that we need no that's it so thank you very much and see you soon